Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Amin Dillon, and on today's episode, I am chatting with the actor who plays the lovable Tobin on Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. That's right, I'm chatting with Kapil Talwalker, who's going to be opening up about his journey into Hollywood and giving us a sneak peek at what we can expect for the rest of the season. Check out my exclusive interview with Kapil. Hey, what's up? I'm Amin Dillon and welcome to my podcast. I'm sitting down with the movers and shakers and the stars to chat about life, love, business, and being a total boss. It's raw, it's candid, it's the stories behind the headlines. This is In Conversation. Kapil, thank you so much for being on the podcast. How's it going, first of all? I am uh, amazing. Uh, I am, I'm just like hanging out at my parents' house right now before I head back down to L.A., we just finished uh, filming the first season of the show, so you know I'm 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 sort of like in this what am I gonna do right now territory, but uh, I'm trying to fill up my days with a lot of creative projects. So, okay, so where's the parents' house? Where's that? I am currently in my parents' bedroom. I love it. So, so yes, this is my parents. This is my parents' bed. And that's, there's a TV there, and this is where my mom does puja back there. So okay, I'm going to say hi, Uncle Auntie, because we're Indian, yeah, so that's what we do. So If they come in with a plate of fruit, you'll they, it'll make sense. You know what I mean? Oh, I'm not. I'm expecting, like, mom's good food, right? Like, okay, actually tell me, now that you're actually, I guess, in quarantine with your parents, what's the best food that you've had? There's perks okay. of being at home. So, yes, so... Uh, my favorite thing are like my mom's like boha in the morning. Um, and I also love, uh, ki- like, it's like a Marathi food. It's called kichidi, like from Sabudana, which is um, tapioca. Uh, and I love that. And it's usually like made on Sunday. So she'll probably make it this Sunday. And, um, and, but, but she makes all t- sorts of Indian food. Like my favorite thing that she makes is like this go in shrimp curry with brown rice and it's gorgeous and uh she yeah so she's like it was like it's like an alternate version of a sanjeev i think his name is sanjeev kapoor who's like the famous chef so she she took his recipe and then changed a little bit to make it like more maharashtran and i it's unbelievable so it's really cool Okay, so I feel like we are a foodie family. I love it. So next time, if I get a chance to interview you in person, we're yeah. bringing Mama. Mama's going to be the official oh, caterer. For sure. And she's, oh my God, my mom is the most adorable human being. She would love that. I kind of feel like we need your mom now on this uh, show, but let's see, maybe a little bit later. So stay tuned, everyone. Uh, but let's... Maybe I'll call her. She'll make an appearance, but I'm just trying to stay the doing the, the uh, six feet until I get uh, a negative test back, so... Oh, okay. I get it. That's very responsible of you. So I, I like that. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about you because right now I feel like you are so lucky because you have one of the best jobs. You get to play Tobin on Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. And like this show is just, if you love Bollywood, if you love musicals, you love acting, this is the show for you. So you get to play this amazing character. So what does it feel like to be on this show? Playing Tobin is not only a blast because the character is so fun he's you know for those who haven't watched he's a bit of a troublemaker he's kind of out there like you know and and it's very very character driven sort of personality like that i get to sort of explore which is a dream on top of that you have a musical tv show where i'm singing i'm dancing i'm working with stars like mary steen version you know first season peter gallagher um and Lauren Graham and Jane Levy, Skylar Astin, Alex Newell, uh, John Clarence Stewart, like the, the list goes on. They're, they're amazing. Like the, the, the talent is fantastic. And as a first gig out of nowhere, where I literally was, was you know, uh, doing like a guest star on like a Lifetime show and out of nowhere, this thing comes up and Within 24 hours, I was on a plane to Vancouver working with all these incredibly talented people. It was very surreal. It was very, very surreal. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there because I always love hearing the story of how people get 
that role, right? Because I just feel like that's like a moment that you'll never forget. Like even when, you know, you're like old and you've got your grandkids sitting in front of you, you're going to be like, let me tell you the story of how I landed the role of Tobin. So please share the story. Okay. So this is how, this is the story. Uh, I got the call at 5 p.m. on a Friday. I was ready to go out with, you know, my guy friends, you know, about to go get some drinks. End of the week, I'd been working. I was tutoring at the time, but I was also doing a bunch of other stuff to sort of pay rent. And so I was like done and I hadn't gotten in any auditions and it's towards the end of pilot season. I was like, I guess I'm not gonna book a pilot or anything. And it was like early March. And then I got a call from uh, my manager. He's like, hey, um, they're trying to cast this very quickly. They haven't found their guy yet. And I saw the, the, the thing and I was like, oh my God, all these people are attached. And, but the audition was so, like they wanted so much in so little time. They wanted a rock song for me to sing. But they wanted me to sing, all I do is win the ludicrous verse. Ludicrous going in on the verse because they never been defeated. Yeah, so that part, a bunch of jokes. And so, like probably like seven pages of like the Tobin jokes in the pilot. There was way more, but you know, things they cut down, but they wanted to see all of it. So to learn a song, to learn another song and to, you know, prep for this in two hours was like, how am I going to do all this? So I canceled all my plans and uh, me and my roommate, Oos, uh, he's like, all right, let's just go do it. Let's just go run this until you get all the jokes. You like know what your version of those are. And, and then like, see, there's, see if there's a song you've been working on. And I was, I was about to play at a farmer's market gig with like a bunch of Queen songs. And uh, I had prepped the first song, Crazy Little Thing Called Love. So I was like, why don't I just sing Crazy Little Thing Called Love? I'm already done. I've already prepped it. It's in my key, everything. He's like, yeah, great, done. Um, and then I saw what song they wanted me to do, which is all I do is win. And I was so blessed here actually, because my sister, Amrutha, she had been playing with my phone and she'd put all of her songs in there. Like, like she listens to a lot of hip hop, more like modern rap and hip hop music. And, and she had put in all I do is win in my phone because we, I think we'd done a road trip recently. And so for the last several months, when I plugged my phone into my car, you know, like the automatic first song starts to play on your like iPod. For me, that was all I do is win. So uh, oftentimes when I would like drive before I even got a chance to change the song, I was like halfway into all I do is win. And I'd heard the ludicrous verse so much that like when when they, they said they need you to do ludicrous first, I was like, I already know it. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a, just an insane coincidence that I didn't have to prep for that. Didn't need to necessarily prep as much for the crazy little thing called love because I'd already been working on it. And then um, all, I, all I focused my time on was, was the jokes and, and the character. So I show up, couldn't find the building because it was closed. Uh, run up. It was first time seeing this casting director, uh, Robert Ulrich. And I was like, I just want to make a good impression. So I went, run into the bathroom and I just feel nervous. I started doing some jumping jacks. He comes into the bathroom and he's like, uh, what are you doing, bro? I'm like, yeah, no, I'm, I'll see you out there. And uh, I go in and he's like, hey, just, you know, so whenever you're ready, whatever order you want to go do this stuff. And I was like, all right, you know what? I'm going to do the crazy little thing called love song first because I'm most comfortable with it. So I did that. Then I did the jokes and then I used my sides, the, the sides where I'm like ludicrous going in on the verse as like, I started to like throw the papers all over the place. Like I'm going insane. Like, because I was done with the like comedy part of the audition. So I just was like, you know, and it just added a sense of movement and a momentum to this character that I'm like, money flying all over the place. And we sort of replicated that in a moment in the, in the pilot where I go like this to leaf. Um, anyway, but yeah, that was, there's so much, yeah. And then uh, I leave and I was like, I either bomb that completely or they really loved it. Wait, wait, so when you leave these auditions, do you actually not know how you did? 
No, because I get a couple of redirects and they're like, you know, Robert was like, okay, you know, um, maybe don't swear in this take because it's NBC. And, uh, and I was like, okay, you know, stick to the script. Got it. Cool. Yeah. And, um, and that was it. And then he gave a couple other redirects. He's like, this is wonderful. Like, do you have any other ideas for this joke? And then I tried the same, there was a joke called, there was a joke where like, um, in the, in the pilot episode, we're all fighting for this job. And I make a joke like, uh, Leafs, this was, this was a cut joke, but Leafs says something like, um, oh my God, this is like the Hunger Games. And then I say, if it is, then Katniss, Katniss always wins that crap, pointing to Zoe. And uh, may the odds be ever with you in your favor. And I did a Stanley Tucci impression because Stanley Tucci is the person that like plays the guy in the Hunger Games who says that. And that just came up in the moment where I was like, originally I was gonna do it like a British accent, may the odds forever be in your favor. And I was like, maybe I'll do it like Stanley Tucci does it. And um, so these like sort of alts, I think they all sent it to them. And then they're like, oh my God, this guy can do this and he can do that. And, but so the next day I wake up and um, you know, there's a bunch of 310 numbers, missed calls, because I did go out with my friends after that. And woke up at like 10 and my manager was like, you need to get on a plane immediately because there's an NBC table read at 8 p.m. today in Vancouver and you need to hop on the plane. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, you booked a job. They love you. So I hop on the plane, go to the table read, 5 p.m. comes along, I land, I go directly to the hotel where everything's happening. And the director, Richard Shepard, um, is directing us through the like like a private table read first and he's like sort of directing us and um i was like oh wow okay this has changed that's changed that's changed. this is like the most updated script and then we get a two-hour break for like to grab a bite to eat and then at 8 p.m is the nbc table read which i had booked a pilot before but this was a whole different thing we show up into this room i think it was like uh i think it was the hilton or some big hotel in vancouver um and we go and we, they had booked this big room. And on one side of the room were small mics for all of us. And one said Tobin. And on the other side was like 60 seats for executives to sit and like five cameras pointed at us that a feed that's gonna go directly to the LA NBC office. And I was like, how can we act like this? This is such high, and like, you know, you, you hear stories about people getting cut after the table read and everything. And I, we were all so nervous. And I still remember like Jane was pacing, like looking at the thing and Skylar was like, yeah, you know, um, don't worry about it, dude. Just like do your thing. And um, that's where I met him. And he's, you know, now one of my clothes, he's like a brother to me now, but uh, yeah, and they loved it. And, you know, we all, kept our jobs and yeah. and made the pilot and made the show and here I am two seasons later yeah okay so I, basically this is what I love about these stories because it's like one day your life just completely changes like one day you're just like oh I guess I'm not gonna have a pilot I'm just gonna go with my friends and literally 24 hours later you book this gig and it's Com completely changed your life completely completely i had no i had no like like i had no clue that that was gonna happen like it was so surprising it came it truly came out of nowhere i was like i don't know with how how mm -hmm. um yeah but so grateful yeah okay so let's talk about pre uh i always also appreciate the before you make it life right because i always feel like with actors you really gotta hustle like it hollywood is not easy and you know you hear with these stories about people waiting tables and doing odd jobs you're mentioning the farmer's market right like you basically take every opportunity to showcase yourself because you just never know when your next break will be but it can be hard to keep that faith to keep going so let's talk about your journey so when did you actually make the decision of I'm going to pursue acting full time professionally? I'm going to get myself an agent and this is what I'm going to do. Talk about that to getting Zoe's. Like how long was that uh, a long period or was it just like a short period of you trying to get out there? It was. It was a long period. I had. I, it was about four years. I sort of auditioned for a play in my high school 
and uh, it was called Lysistrata. And I didn't look. My my grandpa was, you know, uh, an actor in, in Indian cinema, but I didn't know too much about him because when we visited, I felt like everyone's like, "Oh my God, dude, the grandson of Sherrod Thoker," and this and that. And and but I lived in the states, so I didn't really feel that, and I didn't understand like. And and the the movies that I watched of his was such a like a higher level of Marathi that I couldn't really understand anyway. So I just on my own sort of intuition wanted to audition for this play because I really took I took drama as an elective in high school and I wanted to go audition. Got this great role. Kept on getting roles in in high school. Like and that was that validated the fact that hey that like maybe this is this this is something I'm good at and went to USC. I'd gotten into a bunch of different schools for acting, but they were very expensive. And I talked to my parents and, you know, it was like one of those deals that you make with your mom and dad. We we're like, okay, well, you can audition for the plays at USC, but make sure you major in business, you know, major in business, major in psychology. And it was challenging because I wanted to get the training, um, but, I didn't want to, like, I couldn't pay for it. It was expensive. And so uh, I'd gotten a bunch of different really fun roles in college too. And that was like solidified that in a bigger pond or ocean, I could still compete against, I was stealing roles from white dudes left and right. And I had to do that my whole life, you know? I played Sinjin Hotchkiss from the 1800s. I was the only person of color in a play. I played like, and this has happened constantly throughout my career. I played Charlie Brown in You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, John Proctor in The Crucible. Like these are characters that are like, all right, this is the white guy, right? And Tolan was an open ethnicity call too. So like it could have gone to a white guy, but you know, I'm credit to um, Austin and the EPs for, you know, um, having an open mind and, uh, that's but, something I really appreciate about the show is that it does have diversity. I really actually love that. That it's not like everyone looks the same. You've got people of all shapes and sizes, all colors represented. Yeah. And it's not like we have to check this box to do this thing. It was just like, oh, my God, she would actually be great as his wife instead of this character. And he's actually so funny. Like, he could do this. And so that's what I love about it, too. And, and so that was sort of my journey. And then after college, I did a play, a professional play that got, you know, me some attention and like, I went down the theater route um, and I was auditioning, I was auditioning, I was auditioning. I booked a couple of pilots that didn't go to series. That's when I knew that I should keep sticking to it because when booking a pilot, like that means I, I beat out a lot of people to get the role and that gave me the confidence to be like, if I did something once, I can do it again. But that's got to be tough to book a pilot and for it not to get picked up. Cause now you're like getting to meet the cast. You're getting to know the character and you're getting excited. And then it's like, no, we filmed the pilot. We filmed false prophets. We filmed arranged. We filmed uh, operational fellow with Viola Davis and, and Julius Tenen and, and, uh, um, and I just, for me, it was a lot of like excitement and heartbreak, excitement and heartbreak. And I was really like, honestly, I got, it was really de depressing. And towards the end of 2018, I'd done this three times now and, and nothing had worked. And I was like, how many times do I get to roll the dice? And maybe like I'll roll the dice and keep on rolling and it doesn't happen. And, and I was like, well, I'll give it like a year or two more because like it was also hard to like I, I was not making a ton of money I had done like a bunch of different odd jobs like you know Postmates and Uber and tutoring I'd met one of my mentors Anna at one of the plays that I did in in LA and she played my mom in an East West Players production of um, the free outgoing and I met her through that and she's like you should be tutoring you're like smart and you know, good, good SAT score. Thanks mom and dad. Uh, and so like you, you could tutor and make more money that will allow you to have more free time to like focus on your auditions and stuff like that. And so she was a lifesaver for me. And um, 
but yeah, around 2018, at the end of 2018, I was like experiencing tremendous amount of anxiety. I couldn't leave my bed because I was just like, if this, is this ever going to happen? Like, this is so heartbreaking. Um, but then, and then I got into a really big rut where I was like, I don't, I, I don't care about like, and, and my auditions started to suck. I started to get feedback where like, he wasn't prepared. He like, and that, that was that pilot season in 2019 where it was like, he didn't care. He came in without, and I had gotten good auditions because I'd booked the pilots and he's like, well, he, he wasn't off book for the final round of something and, and this and that. And, and I was disappointed in myself. And then finally, um, Zoe's came and I was like, when I had read it, I was like, this is me. Like the character is me. Like I have a, I have a very dark sense of humor. And, and I think that, but my personality is light and playful. So I think I was like, how can I channel that into Tobin? And, um, that's what I saw in the character and that's what Austin saw. And um, I'm very, very grateful for it. Yeah. Tobin's an interesting character because when season one, he kind of like, I was like, would I be friends with them? And I'm like, I don't think I would. Like he kind of like, I feel like he's very much like a dude. Like, you know, he just like still like, I feel like he would make fart noises. He would do like a whoopee cushion kind of thing. Like that to me would kind of annoy me. But I like the fact in season two, we're starting to see sort of the other side to him. And I'm hoping we get to explore it a little bit more. So can you actually give us some insight for the fans, because I'm sure they're dying to know what they get to explore with Tobin. What will we see from him this year? Tobin's still going to be Tobin in terms of like, there's this big, you know, in, in Zoe's Extraordinary Reckoning in episode six, we talked about systemic racism in uh, the workplace. And Tobin um, basically uh, revealed a lot of stuff that he has been going through in, uh, in the workplace. And that was a big moment because... He usually is like, I'm going to tow the company line. I'm going to like have a good time. I'm going to go home, drink my beers, hang out with my buddies, date girls. Like that's his life. And this was a big moment in something like that, that changes perspective as to who he, where his allegiance is. You know, it's his allegiance is to other people of color who, who have, uh, uh, um, you know, worked hard to get to their position. And, and it was like his, it was his moment of how to be an ally to other people of color. And, and I think there's like a vulnerability that comes from that. And like that usually a character like Tobin wouldn't want to show. So I think it's opened up so much more for him to allow things in. And I think what you'll see, and especially in like, like you know, in episode seven is funny, back to Fun Tobin for a sec, right? But in episode eight, you see him finally holding very, very vulnerable feelings for uh, someone, you know, well, Mackenzie in the, in the workplace. And um, I'm excited for the fans to see how Tobin grapples with love mm -hmm. and how a character like that um, who, who hates to show his vulnerability, hates to be, always wants to be on top of the joke, always wants to be like, ah, ha, ha. how does that person efface himself to be present for, to fall in love? Um, or not. I think his character is very relatable. I think, especially when you look at, um, you know, I just think of people that are online that tend to, you know, just hide behind, you know, like trolling or comments. And you're kind of like, you can't be that mean. And it's usually if you really get to know them, it's a cover. So I feel like your character is very relatable to a lot of people. And I think that's why they appreciate him. There's a like a WhatsApp, sorry, a group me chat that I have with a bunch of my Chicago friends. They're all Indian. And we're all just ragging on each other constantly, trolling on each other. But what's so weird is like, when we all hang out, we're all like, not that mean. And we're actually so super dorky nerds. I'm like, 
it's easy when you're hiding behind a screen and saying some some things to run to be clever and this and that, but it's harder when you're there with the person in front of you. Okay, let's talk about the music now, because I think what's great, especially from somebody like me who comes from more of a Bollywood entertainment industry, is we're used to having our shows and movies have those random songs that come up and you're just like, yeah, like this is the song that like either it becomes your song of the summer or like the song at the wedding. So you guys, especially with uh, season one, would bring these like classics that you would like redo in your own way. And it was like really cool because you like the song, but then you get to hear your version. Now we're going to see some original music coming from you guys. So I'm excited for that. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So uh, in episode eight, we will see our first original song of the show. And uh, it's written by Austin. And it's about, um, it's so funny that the song is is about, is, is on Zoe's birthday from Aiden to Zoe. And uh, it's it's actually really catchy. It just the lyrics of it get a like the fact that David is playing in the band with um, with with Aiden, and he's singing this love song that he doesn't know is about Zoe to his sister, and how weird it is that he realizes in the moment that it's about her. Um, I think that's like the the funniest thing ever, but. The song is super catchy, um, and uh, and you know I, I was just like really excited for everyone to see it. Very cool. Okay, so I'm almost out of time with you, but I just wanted to uh, maybe get some advice from you. Being for their big break, what advice would you have for them? Make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. First of all, do it for the art. Do it because you love to act or you love to sing or you love to, you know, paint, whatever you just in, in the art form, right? For me, it's made me realize that like, I could have done this longer than waited for two years to not and then quit because I really just liked acting and it would be very hard for me to leave it. Um, even if it's doing small theater projects and plays and, and short films and creating things. It's just like stay involved as much as you can. Obviously people need to pay rent and people need to do all this stuff. And you know, we can find time to do that. But if it means enough to you, then you, there's always be time in the day. There will always be time in the day. I mean, now I'm at a place where like, because of this show, I don't necessarily have to do that right now um, in order to pay rent. So now I have the luxury to have used that time for other creative projects. So I'm just saying like, use up your time. Like if this is means so much to you hustle, like right now I'm, I'm, I'm writing a bunch of original music. It's uh, like a mix of like old school Bollywood music mm -hmm. mixed with like nineties hip hop. And I, I wanted to use some of the like melodies in like an Arabic scale uh, that we don't usually hear nowadays. Um, and, and so uh, uh, that's something I'm doing. I'm working with a uh, brown guy, music producer, Akil, who's in LA. But when I go to LA, I'm gonna be doing all that. Point is going back to advice stuff, do that. Use up your time with every single second of your time. Like, don't go to Coachella if you don't have to. Like, baby, don't go to, you know, the, 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 that extra, like, thing that's your leisurely thing. If, if, you, if, if this means enough to you, you would spend enough time in your day in order to do the things that you need to do to succeed and, like, live that artistic life that you want to live. So um, I think it's just prioritizing. I love it. And I would love to have you back once you have the new music released. We'll do something just focusing on you and your music then. Cool? Yes. Yes. So let's get you back. And then you can even do like a little acapella session for us. You know, I'm sure the love, fans would love that. I mean, just a little teaser. I'm using Rup Tera Mastana. Rup Tera Mastana, Pyar Mera Divana, Bhul Koi Ham Se Na Ho Jai. And then it launches into a rap. So 
All right, I hope you enjoyed that exclusive interview with Kapil Tawalker. Now, if you want to see more episodes like this, please do subscribe to this channel. Also, be sure to give this video a like and leave me a comment below and letting me know what you love about the show. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I'll see you in my next video.